Okay, your B1 exam is very, very close. Time for some last minute power revision. Okay, a couple of hints and tips. Um, read every question carefully, obviously, underline command words. You can bullet point answers. And remember, they cannot go beyond your specification. They can't ask you things that you've never been taught. It could be a different scenario, but it's still related to what you've done in lesson. And then finally, make sure you answer every flipping question. Okay, let's start first of all with some work. I don't want to do any of this yet. We'll do that afterwards. Let's start with nervous system. Okay, now what do we know about nervous system? Here on the board is a load of keywords, but actually screw that. Let's go straight into a general response that your nervous system would help you to, to do. Yeah, so imagine this is moi. Let's go back. This is me. Me just chilling, and let's say I burnt my hand. Ouch! Ouch! Painful. Just burnt my hand. Now, how do I know that when I burnt my hand to move away from the thing that's actually burning me? Well, first thing, you have a stimulus, and in this case, my stimulus is what? My stimulus is just the heat. Yeah. So I recognize that. Well, what actually recognizes that? What actually recognizes that is something called receptor cells. So on your skin, you've got receptor cells. Okay, now what do I do with that information? That information is sent along something called sensory neurons. Sensory neurons. These are the first ones. Then it will then go to your brain, which your brain contains relay neurons follow it along then the next neuron is the motor neuron which is usually attached to a muscle that's your affector so basically I burn myself the heat is the thing that I recognize and I've got receptor cells that you notice that they send the information along my neuron, goes to my brain, and then my brain has relay neurons that sends information to my along my motor neuron to the muscle which makes me move out of the way. So the order is sensory, relay, motor. Now all this information is sent along as impulses. These are electrical. Yeah, which makes them very fast. Impulses that are electrical, which makes them incredibly fast. Okay, now what else can you need to remember is a reflex. Now a reflex, do you need to learn anything new really? No, just remember the only difference between a reflex and a normal response is, is in a reflex response, you don't think about it. Yeah, do not do not need to think. It happens unconsciously. You don't need to think about moving. So like when you see a little tester when someone gets a hammer thing and whacks it on someone's knee and the knee just jerks, that's a reflex because you don't need to think about it. And in a reflex one, you normally would not go to your brain. It would just go directly to your spine and then come straight back. That's the only difference. A reflex is just faster. And they call normally call it a reflex arc. Easy. Peasy. That's, there's no difference at all. Okay, the only other thing you could be asked about is something called um, synapses. Now, all you got to remember is, is if you've got a neuron, so this is my neuron. In fact, I can, while I do this, I can also mention some of the structural things about a neuron. The main body, this main area of a neuron is called the, um, oops, axon. And then you've got the dendrites that come off. Dendrites. Dendrites. Yeah, I think that's how you spell it. Okay, dendrites. And then you've also got surrounding the axon. So this bit around it, the axon is really that middle bit there. The bit around it is called the myelin sheath. Myelin sheath. And what's the role of that? That just insulates the neuron, which makes the impulse happen nice and fast. Okay, so... I've got another neuron over here, another one here, and what you should notice is, is that they're not joined together. Neurons are not physically joined. So how do I send the impulse from here 
all the way to this side. The way you do it is, is you send it via chemical messengers. And the chemical messengers, let's change the color. So we go for green. So that new, it gets here and then it sends message across. And the message attached to something called receptor cells on this side, which then sends the information. So let's add a couple of key terms to this. So, change that again. Let's go to black. So these are called neurotransmitters. I don't even know if there's double two T's in there. Oh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Transmitters. So neurotransmitters go across and they attach to receptor cells. Well, just receptors. And what does that then do? It sends the impulse. So the impulse then carries on. That's it. So neurons are not joined together, there's a gap in between, and the gap is called a synapse. That's the name of the gap. Easy peasy. Okay, let's try a couple of questions. Okay, so here's another picture of a neuron. The one thing I didn't mention in a neuron is that there is also um, a cell body. This is the cell body, and that there in the middle is a nucleus. And these bits coming off are your, what are these bits? Anyone know? Should I tell you? I'll tell you. These bits are called your dendrites. Okay. Complete the sentence below by putting a cross next to the answer. The axon carries information along a neuron as, well, it's not chemical, it's electrical. Even though chemicals and neurotransmitters are involved, but it says specifically along the neuron. Describe the role of the myelin sheath. We say insulates the axon. Yeah? And what why is that useful? Allows for for quicker And that's for quicker electrical impulses. So they just move a lot faster. Okay, what we've got? There's a gap between the neurons. What's the gap called? We just discussed the gap. What is the gap called? The gap is just called a synapse. Okay. Humans have reflexes. Describe the root of a reflex arc. Now you know what the normal response is. So, receptor, sensory neuron, relay, motor, and so on. It's exactly the same, just slightly different. So, the first thing is, you detect a stimulus. Detect stimulus. Well, what actually detects it is the receptor. Receptor cells. They detect the stimulus. Now, what's the next neuron? Sensory. Neuron. Passes, impulse, to spinal cord. So normally it would go to the brain. This time it's just going just quickly to the spine because it's a lot faster that way. So rather than going all the way to the top, you just go to the spine and anywhere on the spine. And then you've got relay neuron. Passes information to the motor neuron and then motor goes to effector genetics genes 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 so why have I just said genes a million times? Because genes are very, very important. In every one of your cells, you've got a nucleus. And in the nucleus, what do you have? Your DNA. And your DNA is then in the form of something called chromosomes. You have two of each. And each have the same genes, but you might have different types. So, for example, here and here, it's the same chromosome. In this little area, I've got a gene, and on that side, I've also got another gene. 
They're the same ones, but you could have a different type. There's a special keyword, there's a name for that, that's called an allele. So let's say that this bit, they were both for eye color, which is the one that you get all the time. So this is the eye color gene. I've got one here and one here. Now, whichever ones you have on both your chromosomes will define on what eye color you have. But it all depends on what combination you have. So let's say, for example, I had um, a brown gene on one chromosome and then a blue gene on one chromosome. So a brown one and a blue one. Now, they always say to you the brown was the dominant one. In real life, it generally is, but they could say anything. So they could talk about fur color and the brown one could be the recessive one. Doesn't matter. But again, I've got some more keywords. In my one, the brown is dominant. And my blue is going to be recessive. Dominant one, recessive one. Now, my combination I've got there, because I've got one of each, I am heterozygous. Heterozygous. Because you've got two different ones. If, for example, I was big B, big B, I would be homo. Zygos. And if you're going to be more fancy, homozygous dominant. Or if I was small b, small me, obviously what would that be? Homo, same, homozygous, recessive. Yeah, there are loads of keywords just there. And actually, if you know all of them, the rest is relatively straightforward. There's one more thing. Whatever letters you have is called your genotype. However, what eye colour would I show? If I had a one if I had a dominant brown gene and a recessive blue gene, I would show brown eyes. And whatever characteristic you show is known as your phenotype. Loads of keywords. So let's start from the top. Allele just means a different version of the same gene. Different version of the same gene. Dominant is the dominant one, the capital letter. Recessive is the recessive one, the small letter. And then if I, for example, have big B, small B, I'm hetero because they're different. Heterosexual, different. Homozygous is when I've got two of the same ones. I could be homozygous dominant or you could be homozygous recessive. Boom, done. Really, really simple. Now they ask you all to do with some of this stuff. It could be asked in so many different ways. You should need to know how to do a Punnett square, but we'll look at that in a minute, there's loads of keywords. So here's an example. You must be able to draw Punnett squares. So if this was two people, that could be mummy. That could be daddy. That should say short. I don't know what it's missing. So basically, the short gene, which probably doesn't really exist, but let's just say the tall and a short gene does exist. So mummy is big T, small t. The big T is the dominant, small t is the short, so mummy is tall. Daddy, however, has got two small t's, so daddy is short. Yeah, remember, the only way you can have the recessive ones is if you've got both of the little ones. Both recessive ones. Okay, so what would their babies be like? So how do you point it square? You separate them out, and then you just go T... Small t, t, small t, small t, small t, small t, small t. So how many of their kids, what's the probability of having short kids? 50% would be short, or a half. Yeah? And how many would be tall? Those two. Yeah? Okay, two diseases you always get asked about, sickle cell disease. You become tired easily, shortness of breath, joint pains. Now, what is sickle cell disease? It just basically means your cells have become a weird sickle shape. So you can't carry as much oxygen. That's not the best drawing in the world. But it just means you can't carry as much oxygen. Therefore, you get really tired. Cystic fibrosis, your lungs are constantly clogged with mucus, difficulty breathing, repeated infections, and weight loss. They normally ask you about at least one of those. So probably not both. But then we'll ask you one, and we'll leave that for the moment. Let's try a couple of questions. So, Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder. Parent one, parent two. So, okay. 
use the words or the letters from the box to complete the sentences. So, Huntington's disease is caused by a something allele. So, Huntington's, let's read the whole thing. Uh, is, da, 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 use the words and the letters and phrase. So, Huntington's is caused by the dominant allele. I probably can't read that, but it says dominant. How do I know that? Because look, Huntington's is dominant. So not every disease is recessive. People with Huntington's disease can have the genotype HH or that one. Okay. Complete the Punnett square to show the potential offspring of two parents heterozygous. So both the parents are heterozygous for Huntington's disease. So they both are hetero, that means they both have one of each. So point it square, no, in fact, to be fair, they've made your life a little bit easier and you can write them in here, so we'll do that as well. H, 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 okay, there and there. Definitely got Huntington's disease, big H, small H, definitely got Huntington's disease, small H, big H, it doesn't matter, it's always better really to do the, the bigger letter first. Got the disease and H. H haven't got the disease, so seventy percent, seventy-five percent likely that the, that they will have the disease, which is a high percentage. But what does that tell you? If the disease is dominant, then it makes it more likely that you're going to have the disease because you only need one. Okay. Explain why, if both sets of parents are heterozygous, the chance of inheriting is greater is greater than the chance of inheriting cystic fibrosis. Now. The reason is, what I've just mentioned, cystic fibrosis, look at it here, is on the recessive allele. So cystic fibrosis, let's get, we'll go, we'll go back to that in a second in fact, let's have a quick look. Okay, so let's look at this one. Genetic diagram shows the inheritance of cystic fibrosis. Explain if both sets of parents are heterozygous, the chance of inheriting Huntington's disease is greater. Well, cystic fibrosis is caused by the recessive allele yeah while the normal one is the um, dominant one but well, Huntington's was the opposite so why are you more likely to get Huntington's because Huntington's Huntington's is caused by a Dominant allele. Yeah. You only need one allele to have the disease. Whilst in cystic fibrosis, you'd obviously have more space. I haven't. Only need one allele to have the disease. In cystic fibrosis, so in SF, you would need two alleles okay complete the sentence by putting an x in the box next to your answer a symptom of cystic fibrosis in the overproduction is the overproduction of mucus explain why a man with cystic fibrosis might be infertile now this is a difficult question first thing mucus blocks tubes of reproductive system evolution okay what is evolution all about how are you gonna get the marks so let's imagine the scenario we always get given is giraffes why do giraffes have longer necks supposedly they used to have smaller necks well the way they did this is is they just stretched their necks and over the course of many millions of years they kept on stretching them and stretching them and stretching them sometimes they would even bite the top of the head and they just stretch the necks as much as possible and eventually they all had really long necks wrong that's not right at all that's not what actually happens so please don't believe me when I say that or if you think that's what happens that is not what happens what actually happens is is giraffes are descended from horse-like animals and they would generally have relatively short necks however 
there is variation. Just like you guys, some of you are small, some of you are tall, some of you are skinny, some of you are chubby. It varies. Now, this giraffe was born with a slightly longer neck. So what could he go and do? He could go and eat food that was a lot higher up. So he's like, oh man, I get to eat all the food. This guy's like, oh, give me some of your food. Obviously, he never gave it. He ate it all to himself. He survives. He eats all the food. This guy is likely not to survive. Then what does he or she go and do? Fall in love with another giraffe. And then what happens is, is they have babies. And this gene here, because this is caused by a gene having a long neck, this gene will be passed on. And what will all his kids be like? Have longer necks. This is natural selection. The survival of the fittest. And in a way, it is very random. This variation is random and usually caused by a some sort of mutation. Okay, now what are the steps you should remember? So there's variation, just as we said. There's overproduction, so there's more of there's loads of the animals. They each struggle for existence. Only the best suited will survive. And what do they go on and do? Pass on the characteristics, and then eventually you're only left with those animals who have the best features to survive in the environment. And this takes thousands, if not millions of years. It doesn't just happen randomly. Well, it, well the actual mutation is random, but it doesn't just occur one day, animals just evolve. It generally takes a long time, and you just need to remember these key principles. Because if you can explain that, so here are keywords: variation, overproduction, competition, survival, reprodu reproduction, and change. Boom. Oh yeah. Well, head Nelly clearly takes his clothes off when he gets too hot. What does your body do when it gets too tight? Now, this is all to do with an area called homeostasis. Homeostasis, now, they ask you a lot of the time, what does the word homeostasis mean? Homeostasis means to maintain, so to keep, a constant, stable, internal environment. To maintain a constant, stable, internal environment. Basically, to keep everything the same. Your body temperature the same, your blood sugar level is the same, and your water level is the same. What I'm particularly level interested in at the moment is, is how does your body control your body temperature? So, now, let's imagine, you can think of this in two ways. So, this is normal body temperature. This is normal, yeah? What happens when it gets too hot? When it gets too hot, you will um, sweat. Now, why is that useful? Now, people always just write sweat, but they don't tell me the reason for it. It's because water, well, or sweat, evaporates, which takes heat. Takes heat along with it, yeah? Your hairs lay flat. Also helps to cool you down. Now, the big one is something called vaso dilation all that happens is is this is your blood vessels normally that's a terrible one but that's your blood vessels normally when you when vasodilation occurs your blood vessels just become wider so they become wider therefore more blood will flow through and they will be closer to the surface of your skin the closer to the surface of the skin they are that will mean that you will radiate off more heat, which cools you down. Yeah, like it's just you, you can you can remember like, you can remember you can you must have noticed if you in in games and you and you're working out running whatever it might be that you become more veiny in a way. Yeah, so they actually get they enlarge and they become. They are wider and they get close to the surface of your skin, which therefore means you give off more heat and therefore you cool down. Um, what happens if you get too cold? Well, you shiver. Now, again, people really struggle to give me the reason for why shivering warms you up. Because remember, with any of these, what you want to do is you want to get back to here. You want to get back to here. So how do I get back to normal? You shiver, which makes your muscles respire 
So your muscles use energy, and when they use energy, they give out heat. Yeah, hairs stand up. Why is that useful? It's because it traps a layer of heat. And then finally, vaso. Ah, do it again. Vaso con strict. So instead of them getting wider, instead they get skinnier. Yeah. So they constrict. They get smaller. So less blood flow through, and therefore less heat radiated off. Boom. That's homeostasis in regards to controlling body temperature. Oh yes, quality poop. Series poop. Why did I just show you a video of a cow pooping? Because have you ever gone past the farms and it smells of poop? It's because what they'll put on the farms are things called manure. Well, it's manure which contains poop. Now, why is poop put onto farms? Because poop contains something very important. It contains Nitrogen. And nitrogen is a very important part of proteins. And proteins all to do with growth. And it helps the plants to grow. Plants to grow. Yep, so nitrogen is important in making proteins. And proteins help plants to grow. It's not just poop which is used on farms. They also use fertilizers. But again, what do fertilizers contain nitrogen as well yeah so we know farmers put nitrogen on the fields to help the plants to grow now what happens when so if this is a farm i've got over here and the guy's spending loads of nitrogen nearby i've got a river sometimes what happens is is the nitrogen can fall into the river what that then does is, let's change the colour for a second, that then makes the algae at the top of the river start to grow rapidly. So let's change this up a bit. So what we got? So the algae grow rapidly because the nitrogen has spilled into the river. So nitrogen spilled in should be before that. Nitrogen enters river. Okay, now why is that an issue? Because the plants at the bottom need to need light. And what occurs is is that they then start to die away because of the fact that the algae are blocking the sunlight. Block sunlight. So your plants die. These plants are dying now, they're dead. Now what happens when things die? Microbes break down dead plants. The microbes are like bacteria. So the bacteria break down the plants. Now, when they break down the plants, what then does that mean? That then means, as they're breaking down the plants, they also use up, up O2. They use up the oxygen. So what happens to the poor little fishies? Well, the fishies die. Rest in peace, fishes. They die as well. So the fish die. Is one of... The negative things associated with putting nitrogen on farms is that sometimes it spills into rivers and this whole process is called eutrophication. Okay, so we know nitrogen is put onto farms which help um, plants to grow in the form of fertilizers and if that ever spills in, the algae grow like crazy, 
they block all the light. What then happens is, is your microbes break down the plants, they use all, all the O2, and then finally your fish die. That's called eutrophication. Okay, classification. Okay, you need to have an idea of how classification works. So the kingdom, there are five kingdoms which we'll look at in a minute, and these two. These are probably the two major ones you need to understand. This one, just remember core data, and this one, there's a couple I'm going to show you in a minute. So as you go down, you get more and more specific. That's the most wide, the biggest sort of range you can have. You get, your, every living thing is in one or five kingdoms, and as you go down, you get more and more related. Um, being the same species is the most closely rated you could possibly be. So here are the five kingdoms. Learn the features. Some of these are obvious, like multicellular. Anim animals have more than one cell. No cell walls and so on. Yeah, and they sometimes occasionally ask you about viruses and how are virus are viruses not in any of the kingdoms because vir viruses are considered not living because they don't show characteristics such as growth and feeding. Okay, phylum core data. You get asked about this quite a bit. Now, anything that has a backbone goes into this phylum, but obviously there are quite a lot of animals that fit into that group. So your your things like fish. Um, you've got mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and there's one more which I can't remember. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Big Mike, who's going to tell you a little bit about mammals. Where is he? Oh, here he is. Um, a lion. King of the jungle. Now, what is it about me that makes me a mammal? Look at me, I've got hair. Sharp teeth, forward facing eyes, I've got sharp claws, powerful muscles. Um, let me see, I grew inside my mother's womb, I was born you? alive. Um, uh, what else? My little kittens, well, they drink milk when they're younger. They have to drink milk until they're old enough to, uh, to feed on meat. Uh, what else? Oh, I'm warm blooded. Uh, what else? Um, carnival. Right, so there's a whole lot of things about me. Now, which of those things are exclusive to mammals? It's just two of them. Ooh. Ooh. Which of those things are only exclusive just to mammals? Let's go back and actually look at the features that we're looking for in vertebrates. So these are the three you have to remember. is how they absorb oxygen. So either lungs, gill, gills or skin. Um, actually, the one I forgot was amphibians from before. Okay, um, another one is reproduction, either internal or external. Now, the word for that is oviporous is internal, viviporous is external, so lay eggs. Oviporous is internal, so like you give birth to live young, and viviporous is when you lay eggs. Firmer regulation, now he said he was warm-blooded, the actual word for that is homeotherm. That means you are warm-blooded, poikiloferms are cold-blooded. So if they ask you about how you can categorize different vertebrates, you just talk about those three things in how they absorb oxygen, how they reproduce, and how they control their body temperature. They're the three ones, but try to use the key words. Oh yes, diabetes. I'm better than this guy. Oh yeah. Okay, mate, that's enough now. Let's go back to blood sugar control. What is blood sugar control? Why would you ever want to control your blood sugar blood sugar levels? Well, one reason is is because you don't want to get diabetes. So, how does your body control your blood sugar levels? So, first things first. Let's start off with what normal blood sugar is that's normal levels that's what we want to stay at if it gets too high so that's normally when what when you exercise what i'm on about not when you exercise when you eat so when you eat your blood sugar levels increase they go up now what happens then is is insulin is released by pancreas so your insulin levels go up and is released by the pancreas now why insulin is a hormone let's put that on the side 
Yeah, and what does that do? That basically causes the glucose to convert it into glycogen and it's stored in the liver. Boom. And then what what does that what does that automatically result in? And your blood sugar levels go down and back to normal. What happens though if your blood sugar levels get too low? Now think that will be as a result of exercise. Now, what will then happen is that you know you got glycogen there, which is basically glucose packaged away. So what does your body do? Your body converts glycogen back into glucose. And then that will then result in, in fact, before I mention, what actually, what hormone converts glycogen back into glucose? Glucagon. So two hormones are insulin and glucagon. And overall, what does that result in? Blood sugar levels go back to normal. Boom. Insulin when they're too high, glucagon when they're too low. That's it. Okay. Now, you can add to this the stuff on diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is a serious one where you don't produce any insulin. That's the one where you have to take injections. However, exercise and diet are still important. Type 2 diabetes. Your cells basically don't respond to it very well. That's usually as a result of, of being overweight and just having a bad diet over many, many years. So type 2, you normally get it later in life. And that can only be controlled by the diet and again by exercise. But it's unlikely a person with type 2 diabetes would be um, on insulin injections. Okay. Now here is a six mark question. The human body prevents blood glucose levels from becoming too high or too low. Explain how the human body maintains blood glucose levels within a narrow range. Now, it's a six more question. Now, I expect everyone to be having a go at six more questions because you should all be able to get at least two marks. Like from what I've just told you, you could have easily got a couple of marks here. I'll show you the mark scheme and some of the things you can write. But in this instance, if it's asking about how it stops it from becoming too high or too low, you'd probably want to separate it out into when it's too low and when it's too high. Basically, just discussing what I've just gone through. So look at some of the points. When it's too low, insulin release from pancreas, glucose converted to glycogen, and the glucose levels go down. When it's too high, glucagon released, and the glycogen converted back into glucose. Sorry, when it's too low. Now, everyone needs to have a go at those six mark questions. But don't be afraid to bullet point your answers is fine. And if you can't get all six marks, just go for four, two, three marks. You don't necessarily have to get them all, but don't miss them out. Oh, yes. One more time for good luck. Yes, what am I showing you this? Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because this represents something called a tropism, particularly a phototropism, where plants grow towards light. Now, how in the heck does this work? So, what do we get? So, if light is coming from the same direction, they grow upwards. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit of a better diagram for you so if this is my plant and if light is coming from this direction every plant has something called auxins in its tip now what will occur is so if this is my plant normally and if the light is now coming from this side what will happen is is the auxins so i'm going to draw that out again so let's go back so if that's, again, my sunlight, yeah, the plant will grow towards the sun. And you know why it needs to grow towards the sun is because of um, photosynthesis. But what makes it bend in that direction is because the hormones move to the opposite side. They're only found in the tip. They're always there. But they move to the opposite side where the light is because they cause the cells on this side to elongate. All right, just imagine if... If the one side of your body started to stretch, you would, if my left side of my body started to stretch, I would bend towards the right side. That's all that happens, is the auxins cause this side of the plant to elongate, which makes it bend in that direction towards the light. Photo 
tropism. Now, this can also happen towards the ground. So auxin producing the tip of the root have the opposite effect in the root. They stop elongation and the root grows down. So they're basically causing the root to grow downwards. Auxin slow the growth in the root, so the root so the root grows downwards. The auxin stimulate the growth in the shoot, so it goes upwards. You've got to remember that they do the opposite effect in the roots, but still cause the root to grow downwards. That's called geotropism, or another word for it is gravitropism. And the other thing you need to know about plant hormones are some of the uses of plant hormones. So, um, in fact, before I mention that, it's, it's good to sort of understand some of these experimental things. So they might ask you about, like, if the sun is coming from this direction, and they've covered the tip, is covered with a cap, it just grows upwards because all the light is being spread out. It's an opaque cap. You probably can't really see. This one is a transparent cap. So all the light goes through, which makes it bend in that direction. This one is completely uncovered. This one is, some of it is blocked, but it's still growing that way. This one, the tip is separated. Again, you don't really necessarily need to know all of that, but if you can just be able to interpret some of the data they give you. So obviously, if you completely cover the tip and it's in, a, in like, I don't know, it could be full paper or whatever it might be, then the plant will not recognize, will not be able to detect the light and it won't grow in a particular direction. Okay, last thing is the uses of some of these plant hormones. Weed killers, obviously to kill weeds. Rooting powders to make them grow faster. Seedless fruits, flower sprayed with hormones to make the fruit develop but with no seeds. Obviously it's useful because we'd rather eat fruit that had no seeds in. And then finally, fruit ripening. Why use fruit ripening hormones? Is because then we can make the, the um, fruit ripen at the exact same time. So they can come from the other side of the world, but we'll make it ripe as soon as it arrives at the right place. So that way you can they last for longer and... They can still sell them even if they're coming from all over the globe. Okay, this is like one of those experiments right now. So, plants. Paul investigated the effect of sunlight on the growth of shoots of four plants. Shoot A had no changes made to it. So that's what you'd expect. It would grow towards the light. Makes sense. Um, shoot B had the tip removed. Shoot C was covered with black cap. And shoot D was covered with a clear cap. The growth response shown by shoot A and shoot D, what's this called? Positive phototropism. Positive means it's towards the light. Positive phototropism. Negative phototropism, phototropism would mean away from the light. Explain how shoot A and shoot D show this growth response. Well, the plants... grow towards the sunlight and why does that happen because the auxin you get one more for just saying auxin the auxin diffuses to the opposite side or probably better wording would be to the shaded side and what does what does that result in it results in the cells E long gating. Explain why shoot C did not respond in the same way as shoot A and D. Let's go back. Look at shoot C. It's covered with a black cap. So if it's covered with a black cap, it's not going to detect the sunlight. So no light, no light to the tip. Yep, and to finish this off, is the tip is where auxins are found. Pollution indicators. Now this kind of also leads on to some of the stuff on eutrophication. Now you need to learn these indicators. So air pollution indicators. Black spot fungus. Basically is killed by sulfur di dioxide. So it's an indicator of Sulfur dioxide, black spot fungus. Lichen is a different species that tolerate different pollutant levels. Feathery ones need clean air. Crusty, flatter ones tolerate high levels of sulfur dioxide. 
but in general they lichen indicates that the air is clean water pollution indicators different animals need varying amounts of oxygen stone fire lava and fresh water shrimp need lots of oxygen so they are found in oops, they are finding clean water, stonefly lava and freshwater shrimp. And actually, how can you remember which ones are for clean water and which ones for dirty water? They just sound nicer. Stonefly lava and freshwater shrimps sound a lot nicer than bloodworms and sludge worms, which are both found in polluted waters. Okay, let's try a couple of questions. Water pollution can be caused by an increase in nitrates. And phosphates, explain how the problems associated with an increase of nitrates and phosphates levels in a lake. Well, just as we just discussed not long ago about eutrophication. So you get one mark for just writing eutrophication. And if you remember here, you've been asked to explain. So you need to explain what happens. So this causes an algae bloom or rapid rapid growth in algae and now there's only worth three marks it could easily be a five or six mark question so but we'll, we'll mention some of the points this causes an algae algae bloom plants die yeah they decompose microbes use up o2 and then what happens is your fish die. Yeah, that's eutrophication. Complete the table below for indicators for clean water and indicated for polluted water. Well, what do we know? The nice polluted ones are things like nice polluted ones. Nice clean ones are things like stonefly, larvae, or larva, whatever you want to call it. And then the nasty ones are things like bloodworms. So horrible water, horrible names, clean water, nice names, stonefly, lava. Okay. Diagram shows the river and the location of the fertilized factory. The arrow indicates the direction of the water flow. So it's going from here to here. The scientists recorded nitrate concentrations of water at site A and site B. So nitrate concentrations here and here. Calculate the mean nitrate concentration found at site B. Well, how do you work out the mean? You add the numbers up and you divide by 3. So 49 plus 64 plus 58, 58 equals, and then divide that number by however many you've got. I haven't got a calculator on me at the moment, but it should be quite straightforward. Add them all up and divide by however many you've got will give the mean. The scientists observed algae and some dead fish in river at site B. They were not present present in site A. Give an explanation for these observations. So, they were found, some were found dead in the river at site B, but none at site A. So, some were found dead here, but none at site A. Now, this is where you have to look at the, the picture. You look at the fact that there's a, a factory there. So, what again happens is it's the exact same thing. As what we discussed before, is you get eutrophication again. Is the fertilizer goes into here, and that causes algae bloom and so on. It's just the exact same thing as what we just discussed. I'll show you the mark scheme. So nitrates leaked causes eutrophication. Algae block the sunlight. Dead plants die. The, the plants die. Microorganisms respire. They use the oxygen, and fish die. It's exactly the same as before. Scientists observe living organisms in the environment to assess levels of pollution. Describe how the level of water pollution and the air pollution can be assessed using living organisms. It's basically asking you for examples of the different organisms. So like we've talked about sludge worms and stonefly larva. It's asking you what each of them one each what each one of those are used for. So there's loads of things you can talk about. So you could it probably makes sense to separate this out in in things like, so if we started water polluted, now this will be the dirty water. What sort of things will be used to recognize dirty water? Like we talked about, bloodworms detect presence of 
high water pollution. Yeah, and why can they do that? Because they can survive in low oxygenated water. So they can basically survive in areas where there's low levels of oxygen. And low levels of oxygen would indicate that the poor water is polluted. So what about clean water? What do we have? So which organisms um, live in clean water? Let's do fresh water shrimp. Detect low levels of water pollution and why can they do that is because they can survive they only survive in high highly oxygenated water because they only not only that should say only they only survive in water with high levels of oxygen. So that's the water bit done. And then you can then go on to do the polluted air, which I'll just show you the masking for as I'll be here all day. Um, air pollution. Black spot fungus found on roses. Black spot fungus grows on roses in unpolluted areas. So that would be for in um, because it's killed by the presence of sulfur dioxide. So therefore you would know that the area was was clean. Lichen, such as lichen survive in polluted areas. So depending on the type of lichen found will be will be used to access the uh, pollution levels of the air. So you got black spot fungus and lichen for air pollution and then for water pollution you got bloodworms and you've got freshwater shrimp which detect clean water.